Welcome out to another episode of It's All Been Trek Before. This time, Manhunt. Yeah, it's not a reality show on Fox. It's an episode of TNG, and we're going to talk about it here. Manhunt. Speaking of Manhunt uh, and awkward segues, uh, you know what? Stop the hunt. Go to patreon.com slash IABD. Support us and the entire network. Go there. They just had a great, we just had a great drive. Uh, speaking of hunting, man, woman, animal, all. They, a, lot of, a lot of them are signing up. Get into the party. Patreon.com slash IABD. And now, it's Manhunt on It's All Been Trekked Before. Welcome out to another episode of It's All Been Trekked Before. Your regular hosts are here. This is Steven. And Keith. Jimmy Jerome. And we're all going through our own midlife horny sexual crisis, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We're here to talk Manhunt. Mine is only uh, regular strength. Uh, as, as with Q... Uh, who is a polarizing figure that you either love or hate. I feel yes. like Loxana Troy is also a polarizing figure you either love or hate. And I feel like this episode was a good uh, way to judge <laughs> how much you loved or hated her. Uh, I agree, because I really loved her the first time, and this time I was mm, not <laughs> loving her as much. I that I really appreciate it. Overall, or just yeah, the, overall, that's probably a pretty good assessment, yeah. I, I really appreciated a lot of the callbacks they were using to the first appearance. Uh-huh. I think some of those jokes really landed, but uh, yeah, there, th- this was this was a tough one for her as a character. I think to not be a little too much. Yeah, I'm I'm with both of you too. Uh, this wasn't as good as her first appearance, but I, I actually do adore the character honestly, yeah. I and I too. thought she had some absolutely fantastic moments in this episode. Just overall, the episode wasn't that great. Yeah, it didn't feel like the same exact character as last time to me. Like, really? It, and maybe that's just because I just didn't enjoy it as much, or she wasn't utilized as well. I thought. I, I think the point of it was that she was going through some sort of sp- significant change, mm-hmm. yeah. and I, I don't know. I was entertained overall by the episode, but there were certainly problems that I have listed about some of the things, that, some of the liberties they were taking. I guess to, to yeah. I guess ma- make it into something more farcical. I will say we're uh, reading Imzadi, and that is yeah. going to be one of our bonus episodes between mm-hmm. seasons two and three, and so we'll get some of that backstory on who Loxana Troy was in her younger days. But if I were to pick a second Star Trek novel from that 90s period where Star Trek novels were really mm-hmm. hot, Q and Law by Peter David would top that list, and that is a very heavy, it's Loxana Troy and Q together uh, book. <laughs> Basically, yeah. <laughs> Apparently, I, it was published only at the insistence of Majel Barrett, and Paramount just ignored it. But uh, essentially, the Enterprise is assigned to host a wedding between two houses, and Loxana Troy comes to represent represent Beta Z, and um, then Q puts in an appearance, toying with Picard, and then Q catches Loxana's notice. And she's fascinated by Q, and then Q fla- fans the flames of love, and it's set during <laughs> like season three or four of TNG. So it, it continues her her trend. But what if she turned her attentions on Q? And that's the same guy who wrote Imzadi, right? Yes. Yeah. So at the beginning of this episode, they go to the transporter room to meet Lexiana Troy. Picard's in his dress uniform, mm-hmm. but Riker's not. And but then Troy's later, Riker not. is, isn't he? Or sorry, you're right. Sorry, Riker is when they goes back down. They, yeah, there were yeah. two scenes. Later. Troy, yeah. But Troy was not in her dress uniform when she no. went down. Why the... It almost felt sexist. Yeah, I didn't understand why more people... I feel like the old Enterprise, everyone got dressed up. But maybe, maybe getting dressed up was a bigger thing back in the 23rd century. <laughs> Actually... <laughs> Makes sense. To actually you, Steven. Sure. I remember there were like three or four characters that had dress uniforms in the original series, and the rest of them didn't. Right. Well, I'm, 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 I'm saying two more. <laughs> <laughs> two more. It's twice as many. Sure. <laughs> I, I think we'll see other next-gen characters in dress uniforms. There's a movie where they're okay. all in dress uniforms, and it's a different dress uniform. Well, and while, I, we're on, I, while we're on fashion, yeah. fashion, I, they both look sharp. Yeah. Picard especially. I, I, I dig those dress uniforms. They're better than the ones with the weird colored shapes all over them. Yes, I agree. I, I think so. Well, while we're still in the cold open, I, I have my my joke, which is going to be even better because I just, I've just called it a joke ahead of time. My first impression was that if you told me that we were going to watch episodes named Manhunt, Manhunt and Emissary, uh, which one would open with an ambassadors arriving the ship. 
Yeah. It, I, it was not going to be manhunt. I had, I did the <laughs> same thing. I was like, wait a minute. Am I okay? And now I, I mean, I understand why it's called manhunt now, but for <laughs> mostly not good reasons. But it took I'll get me until that too. Maybe a quarter or halfway through the episode, I go, oh, manhunt. <laughs> Before we leave fashion behind, what did you think yes. of Loxana's dresses this episode? I I think I liked her I, originally I said casual wear, but I think more or evening wear. Her her Picard seduction dress I liked. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and what about the fish costumes? But those were awful. Yeah, like I thought they started off intriguing, but it was like, okay, but we know they're just gonna be not great once they wake up. And I mean, let's get all of our fish notes out of the way at once because it's not a, a heavy plot. No. I thought it was it was dumb that they... Yep. The, <laughs> the end. <laughs> Se- <laughs> section <laughs> over. And they're supposed to store them, but Pulaski has not prepared the spot to store them right. at all. That, that was my thing too right away. It's like, wait a minute, you're just now doing it? Yeah, it wasn't a surprise. And they brought their food with them, their picnic lunch, but... They were supposed to, the whole point of putting them in a catatonic state was so they didn't have to experience space travel. And yet, before they get to the destination, they wake them up and feed them. Like, right. what's the point of putting them in a state anyway? Right. Why not just let them sleep the whole time? I mean, the scene where Pulaski's like, okay, I'm ready in the sick bay now. It's like, but they're almost to the destination. Why are you even transferring them? I, it, it reminded me of, uh, and I don't, I don't have a fear of flying. I have a fear of height, but not a flying, but all the coping mechanisms some people go through to to fly, whether it's quaaludes or alcohol or hypnosis or whatever. So it didn't remind me of that. So I thought initially I thought it was a cool, a cool uh, kind of flip on that. And then this, I I'm confident this will be the most annoyed I ever am with, with, with Wesley, him just going up and going through their food. <laughs> Come yeah. on, man. Yeah. Come on. I, I, you do not go through, you know, if you open a fridge at work and somebody's, Actually, if you open the fridge at home and somebody's like, this is my food, you don't go through it. You know? Worse, worse when they wake them up and they're about ready to eat and they're fully mm-hmm. awake and cognizant. Yeah. Worf just sticks his hand in and right. runs them through right before they <laughs> chow down. Right. I didn't catch that. <clears throat> like I guess I, I, I have more fish notes than I would have realized. So first one, of course, was um, how Dr. Pulaski pronounced it stasis. <laughs> I, I don't know why that, that just, something just popped right out to me. It's sure. a very, very sabotage kind of moment. Keith, I thought you were going to talk about your other podcast, which is about fish, the band. <laughs> I was going to say, oh, they, God. they should have had a fish concert as part of that. <laughs> Sorry. Given who played the lead fish. <laughs> Why? Who, who played the lead Mick fish? Mick Fleetwood. What? Really? Yeah. Oh, well, you know? I missed that. No. What? Yeah. Why would... All right. Wow. So... so <laughs> Uh, he was a longtime Star Trek fan. He really wanted to play an alien on the show. They made him shave off his beard, which he wasn't happy about, but he agreed to do it as long as he got to be, either be transported, because mm-hmm. he thought that was cool, right. or be or actually eat the gunk-like food. So he agreed to shave off his beard because they let him be on the transporter and eat the gunk-like food, which he thought but, was like marks of being an alien. They didn't have makeup on, did they? I thought it was just like a... Oh, foam. no, it was, it was a full makeup and really? prosthetic and everything. Okay, well, then I'm a little more impressed with it. Yeah, yeah I mean, some, some of the, some of the shots were... the main were... one. The second guy was a background actor. Okay, it looked like H.R. Puffin stuff kind of outfit to me, but okay, that, that's interesting. Some, some of the angles were better to show that off than others, and I, yeah. I spent a lot of it thinking, okay, it's... Well, they, they kind of telegraphed that they were going to have to do something with them because they obviously weren't mannequins when they had them right. standing up and moving. I was like, why would you even bother to have these shots of live actors doing this for this long. And of course we have to pay off by the end. But uh, at, at the beginning, I, w- Wesley's comments already, I, I noted were just out of character. Yes. It's very much for the, either the audience's benefit or flavoring this whole episode a little bit more farcical. Yeah. As I was saying. And it was, I it was, like- it was out of, it was, it was out of character for a boy of Wesley's age and Starfleet to go, the, the aliens look weird or look strange. They asked him, what do you think? What do you think? It looks strange. Like what? I, I, I feel like they stick him with that a lot, and I, I I think those are his most annoying moments. Which so he didn't start off good, and then of course, like I said, he got into their lunch and dinner and breakfast probably mm-hmm. too. But yeah, I agree with you, Keith. Like we've seen him do the awkward exposition before, whether he's like, "Why is this happening?" or whatever, and this was just it made it even on a higher yeah. level. Though yeah. I did appreciate the callback; it, it provided the callback to one of my favorite. Is there in truth no beauty? The whole. 
the last prejudice of the universe is, you know, beauty or lack thereof. Mm, but so, it, it's it's very strange that uh, even even for the war thing, we've seen him interact with right. maybe stranger looking aliens between here and there. something, right? It's just mm-hmm. anyway. But I like uh, that we're saying that what a handsome race and how impressed he was yeah. by them. That was a yeah. that was a funny that was a funny little thing right I like there. That but yeah, but at the same time, would a Klingon be impressed by a species that's too scared to be awake during space travel? You're right, probably not. That seems like something that he would be more likely to comment on, you would think. Right. To Stephen's line about the last great prejudice or whatever, yeah. there is a line in here about judging by appearance the last human pre- prejudice. Mm-hmm. And then it, mm-hmm. it also kind of seemed to echo Loxana kept talking about specific things that were human male related that did not extend to males of other species. <laughs> and it felt like there was a lot of commentary on humans in this episode for some yeah. reason. Yep, this is um, stilted, I guess, for lack of a better word. Just the way that I don't, I'm not sure. Have you talked about who wrote this episode yet, or not, or what, no, what we else are going to? So let's um, talk about it. It was written by Tracy Torme, uh, who used a fake name, Tracy Devereaux, and Tracy was a, a big story editor overseer. Uh, and this was like the end of Tracy's run. Tracy got run off. The other episode Tracy wrote. Uh, was the Royale and the yeah, schizo- right. and did the teleplay yeah. for the schizoid man. That kind of makes sense. Why, why was she run off? He. Oh, he. Yes. Okay. Yeah, because, this is the one. Oh, this is the whole thing. <laughs> because he wrote the schizoid man. Uh, <laughs> no, because he didn't yeah. get along with the yeah. lawyer that got put. That's yeah, right. Given right. power in season two. Interesting. Uh, just one more note on the, uh, this will be my last is there. Truth will be mentioned this episode. Of course, you guys all remember Diana Moldar was in that episode so yeah, she was hmm. a little bit of a bridge there so huh. so uh you, you mentioned another thing but the whole thing about the humans being called out specifically it uh Lux, luxana had a line later on i think they're maybe in the uh holodeck or something it was very much that classic kind of star trek or classic sci-fi thing of making human the human-centric view of things or rather mm-hmm. it kind of mirrored the like the white american view of of other cultures and races mm-hmm. and so forth she, she yeah. made the comment that so, there's something about humans that are basically universally appealing mm-hmm. uh, just to uh, to sum that up or to paraphrase i guess what she was saying is the there's that idea in science fiction that uh, humans are magnanimous somehow for being able to look past all these weird things about all these other races but everyone thinks they're attractive you know I was just like, have you been to Earth? <laughs> well, have you met any other humans? <laughs> well, the fact that Loxana was married to a human right. I guess, speaks yeah. to her own personal biases. Yeah. So I kind of took that as that's her opinion. It's not necessarily a widely held opinion. <laughs> Although, you know, Sarek married a woman. A it seems to be a common theme of people from other planets marrying humans. Well, 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 next episode, we're going to get another... Uh, I haven't seen that yet, but, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> it, seems, it seems like the, we've extended from RPG stuff, too, if you think about it. The idea of, uh, you know, race classes oh, yeah. and so forth. It's, yeah. it's usually a, a human hybrid of some sort. It's just, I guess, obviously, it has more to do with the audience. Obviously, it's an audience of humans <laughs> who are consuming it's all the sci-fi, but you think of it in that kind of... Star Trek is a very human-centric series. I wonder why they didn't make it a, a Klingon-centric series. <laughs> it's almost yeah, like I mean, they thought it would only be watched by humans, which right. is a different side of them, if you ask me. Yeah. It is us, us venturing out into the, the universe, I guess. But yeah, and, and I guess, and I think it hasn't totally changed here, but you know, obviously the original series, Spock was kind of the... You know, we, we learned a lot about him being half human, half Vulcan. It was really a struggle for him. Whereas I think we're getting a little different story with everyone in this. Deanna's experience versus what I think is going to happen next episode and some other <laughs> was half good. human, half whatever. But it's more of a melting pot kind of yeah. thought and looking at it in a positive way rather than some of the speciesis, speciesism of, of TOS. And, and to be fair, TOS took place in a different time. And it Wait was, for DS9. There is lots of speciesism. Okay. So, well, yeah. I, mean, I, I guess the positive way of looking at it Mm-hmm. Um, since it is uh, marketed toward humans, mm-hmm. and we're, they're holding us up as the uh, you know the best or ideal race among all these others, is that it speaks to humans uh, being more willing to interact with other species in that way. I guess. 
uh, holding them up as being sort of like the, the more accepting, which is why there you, are a lot you, of you isolationist know, species on Star Trek. Yeah, where you would where yeah. you would have where you'd be more likely to have human hybrids than other you know hybrids between other species. That's a way to paraphrase what the comedians or bad comedians used to always say about Kirk: "He'll do anything." So yeah, so yeah. humans will, or, will have sex with anything in the universe, especially male <laughs> humans. So <laughs> I'm not a womanizer or right. somebody that's had a lot of sexual partners. Uh, I would sleep with most aliens. Yeah. Just throwing it out there, sure. aliens there yeah. listening. Well, while we're while we're doing those classic bits, of course, we have to mention green skinned women because that's really what uh, the, the ideal alien to go for is a green skinned woman. The Orion, yeah, yes, yeah. I mean, green has always been my favorite color. <laughs> you know, when all is said and done, Susan Oliver is still going to be my favorite. Although she's not even my favorite when she's green. It's the other parts that episode. <laughs> well, wait, save that for next week because Taylor like, yeah. might give her a little bit of her own I, money. Just I, saying. I, I, <laughs> I, I have a good feeling about her. <laughs> so I do, I do want to ask, do you two believe that any of Picard's naughty thoughts were legit or just Loxana messing with him? I, I wanted, you know, uh, that's, that's a good question. I was probably going to bring that up as well. It just seems like a strange running gag to do. I don't know if she really believes it or not. Deanna hinted at the fact that maybe her thoughts were in her readings were inaccurate because of this process she was going through. That's possible. I, I tend to think that a lot of it is just her way of flirting and he's not really thinking dirty things, but by her saying it, it makes him think dirty things. Right. Mm. But I do think at the end of the episode, it felt like it might, actually be true or else she was just giving him one last poke i think i i kind of think that way too jimmy because i thought early on what's wrong with her and then it was like oh there is something wrong with her or and i think is it deanna what's, or somebody or picard says that might be throwing off the phase might be throwing off her her, but it's, her well, yeah, I was, I was, yeah deanna was saying that or, yeah. yeah it's like if you're talking to a woman and you're looking her in the face and she's like are you looking at my boobs and even if you're not you're gonna look then I it's feel that, like it's yeah, it's that, thing. it's that inception, it's, isn't it inception where they say something along those lines? If, yeah, I think so. If, if I mention this, you're immediately thinking of it. You don't have a right. choice. Yeah. So, so, I mean, it's a good technique for Loxana to use because, yeah. yeah. I mean, honestly, she's a much older woman than I, well, she's, she's nothing now, but she's a much older woman than <laughs> I am. But I always thought Majel radiated a, a attractive energy and... I don't know. I, I get it. I get why she'd be the type of character that would have men after her. What, when did Majel die? Oh, I don't know. Maybe 10 years ago? I'll have to look. Man. Uh, while you're doing that, we'll stick with Majel. To go back to fashion, fashion, and I went ahead and <laughs> researched and answered this myself because I was like, oh, is she wearing contacts? Because I didn't notice it as much last time for whatever reason. And obviously she was. And I con- kind of confirmed it because when I got done watching this episode, I went back to my TOS unofficial rewatch and what are little girls made of with the next episode. And I was like, Oh, okay. Beautiful. She had the blue eyes in. I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's her natural color. Uh, and I was like, yeah. And while, yeah, while we're talking about how attractive she was, yeah. Nurse Chapel. Beautiful. And I, really I think episode. number one was in my opinion, the most attractive of her character. That, yeah. Yeah. There's something to that too. I, she, hmm. She that's died a, in December 2008, Keith. And that's why okay. the I huh. just forgot the 2009 Star Trek movie had a... That's right. ...do her at the end. Yeah. And she stood the computer on TNG, right? On TNG, yes. So she and was ta- love, talking to herself. Scene yeah, in this I, I noted that. I, I, I loved it. I uh, did too, but, but it, it was... It's almost like, is her ego so big? Like, <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I thought it was a... I thought they were just having some fun with it. And I, it was just, yeah. for me, just... The, the, the like the knocking on the wall too to hello computer just i i loved it the whole the whole bit oh yeah I, but I, it's something i wouldn't have gotten back then because i really didn't know the significance of that reference and I I mean, think as, as far as far as her doing the voice i mean for the computer yeah i think that was definitely definitely one of those star trek things where it's like because i did it to, actually i did it to colleen when i was watching i was like do you know who she's talking to do you know who she's talking to do you know who that voice is do you know who that is that's her she's talking to herself she's having a conversation with herself <laughs> So I know I would have done that 30 years ago watching it. So, but, uh, but yeah. Oh, I have a question, Jim, Jimmy, because we were talking about Imzadi. I feel like she acts like she's never met Riker before. Oh, I didn't get that impression. Okay. Because hmm. maybe I may- was reading too much into it, but I, I got the okay. impression she knows him. Okay. Because I thought when she looked at him, like, I thought I got the impression she was like, well, who is this? Okay. So maybe, and maybe 
Maybe she I talked to him something. in the previous episode, and there was mention right. of the past. Okay, that's what I yeah. thought. Okay. okay, it seems like they were making more of a thing of it in this episode for the purpose of that whole uh, he's off limits kind of oh, interaction Bonnie between and her and Deanna. Yeah, I got notes about that too. But oh, before we and, get there, <laughs> yeah, while we're, I have one more fish though, but that's something I can come back to you after we we're, we're well into the Majel stuff uh, or the Luxwana stuff. Um, I why doesn't why does Picard and this goes into bigger part issues in the episode. Why doesn't Picard just, why, isn't he attracted to her though, or no? He's got to be. I think my guess is, obviously the ship, he's right. not going to marry her, and she's looking for a, right. a mate, not just a yeah. hookup buddy. And also, I think with a level of professionalism of you don't sleep with your subordinate's mother, is that is one of his most trusted Maybe. advisors. <laughs> was it like a George Costanza kind he, of? That's what I was doing. <laughs> was that wrong? Should I have not done that? Because if I had known, I would not have done that. To think of it before he does it. He's the anti George Cassandra. <laughs> That's for sure. I mean, they're both bald, but other than that. My my impression of it was that it's more about Picard being, I think, too introverted to really be into her. I mean, I, I really don't think they they should get along, and it's just kind of I I, I can see him or I can see her rubbing him the wrong way quite a bit, and he's just kind of like. Ah, you know, well, yeah, uh, she's, could... she's physically attractive. Sure. But it's just the personality thing would be. I was gonna say, yeah, that's, that's, that's yeah, fair. I think he has to be physically attracted to her, but you make a good point about personality attraction. That, yeah. That explains like with, with crush. I mean, obviously with crusher, they have those scenes and Crusher's so much more reserved and quiet. Yes, exactly. So I think, I think that that's a good point, Keith. And also, uh, who was his, who was the love of his life? Was it Gabrielle and, Oh, psh, nobody even remembers that woman. That was stupid. <laughs> I remember, um, you know what? I'm remembering the girl that wasn't Gabrielle. That's who I always remember. Yes. <laughs> no, we will get a love interest for Picard that is more large-esque. Vash has a very mm. outgoing personality. And she is an actual love interest for Picard. So I, I think he could be attracted to a Majel like person. But then... When I think about it, Vash is an archaeologist. She's into history. She's into some of that other stuff. And Majel is into being a socialite and being yes, rich and being right. there. So, and she's she's like a wrecking ball kind of yeah, extrovert, which but, is that kind of you know very much against the sensibility of uh, you. You want something uh, for a stuffier kind of more traditional captain as, as Picard is. You need someone who who can understand at least how to navigate that kind of you know. You know what I'm saying? It's just yes. And I guess here's my problem with not necessarily the episode, but with the Enterprise. I guess you know we find out about the phase, and her her desires might be quadrupled or more, or more. <laughs> which I, I love that. But oh, the the Riker getting the or more. <laughs> yeah, and just, and just st- staring at the, <laughs> at the end after you didn't tell me or more. And then here are the solutions they come up with. Here are the solutions because in my mind, the Tawana is on a ship with. What at least five hundred men, and yeah. let's say half of them are eligible. And here's the here here Riker's idea is: here's what an honorable woman should do: either isolate herself so she doesn't bang anyone, or focus on one man. And I looked at Colleen and I said, "Am I wrong, or are they slut shaming?" She's like, "They're slut shaming." I'm like, "Come on, this is yeah." So I was just the was, let's uh, wait. The writing let's focus was on that. shaming. Yeah. Roxana was looking for a single mate, and I agree with you, Stephen. I think she'd be banging everybody on the ship. I I totally think I, so, so. I don't understand why looking for one man is necessarily the only honorable thing she can do. I know she's an ambassador and all that, or or whatever. Well, let's let's back up for a moment. Who 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 actually said honorable in that? I mean, was it Riker's uh, interpretation? Was it just something I think they kind it was of? Was Riker? I think Riker said it. But uh. Troy's the one that said she was looking for a mate to marry. And, okay, maybe she did. Say I mean, that. The, the the implication could be that uh, Luxana herself is traditional, or it's just something that they, the some sort of old fashioned kind of writing thing that they slipped in there. Well, as far I as mean, uh, I certainly don't think Luxana's traditional. First of all, she married a human. Mm. And maybe that raises a different point, Keith. If 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 you were going that way, then I also we're still stuck in old male, female po- sexual politics in the sense of she's traditional, so she wants to focus on one man. But it doesn't matter which man, though. She's just going to pick whoever. <laughs> which, right. to me, yeah. it, like, her going through the phase is me at that time in history. I was 21, so I was still in the phase. I'm still not sure I'm out of it. But, yeah. you know, so well, I, mean, I just thought it was just it was just weird. And I also think, I don't know if it's an age thing or not either, um, that an, 
an older woman should be, you know, you well, know, that's, it, it's a comic trope. Getting back to the whole old fashioned thing. We're, we're still in the future when it's hard to, it's, it's, mm-hmm. it's just the way that things, it's the way that writers can't quite get out of a certain mindset because mm-hmm. of the way things have always been written up to that point. And mm-hmm. also it's, it's for eighties television and things were still, yeah, they weren't there yet. They, they no. couldn't really uh, put a woman in, in charge of her sexuality and quite to that extent and have her just, you know, it's it's got to be well. And she she's an look, older woman, and so she's uh, interested in marriage, and you know. Yeah, and I didn't say to that extent. This I, to all of our I female prob- listeners. Yeah, <laughs> I probably yeah, I probably wasn't that enlightened then either. Although I, my reaction I think then would have been like, I, it would have been the same reaction. Like she should get what she can get. Come on, she's such yeah, a lot of Troy. What we know of beta Zeds, they're very open. They have to be because they're right. all in each other's minds all the time. And, they're naked and they have the naked time. weddings and they do <laughs> right. all this uh, stuff. It doesn't make sense to me that she's looking for monogamy at this point. Yeah, it, it just, it was definitely forcing a, forcing it. I do think Riker heard, oh, when you're older, you have four times the sexuality. And Riker immediately said, okay, Troy, when we're 40, if we're not <laughs> married yet, let's lock that down. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think th- I think that that just echoes the the problem with the episode overall, which is like mm-hmm. really just the, the old fashioned mindset of the writer, and of course to force things into a comic mm-hmm. uh, framework. But about that that comment that quadrupled, my first thought was, how are they quantifying a sex drive? <laughs> how can you how can you say that four times or more? It's well, it's if the- you normally have sex three times a week, now you want it twelve times a week or more. He, they God. tested her many times. Time. One time. Many- yeah, I- they just are midichlorians. They were very high. <laughs> yeah, we don't know what kind of scales they have in the future to measure yeah, such that's things. <laughs> so you talked about throwbacks earlier, Keith. I like that this time Riker got a chance to carry the bag. Instead yes, of the that that was that was actually my my earliest chronological note we hadn't gotten to yet. Was the Me suitcase too. thing was, that, it was so good. That was a great callback, and and the chimes. And Riker still doesn't <laughs> yes. lift with the legs. He his back should have been thrown out the way he picked that up. Which led me to be like, that's poor direction. But <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I love just the, the way he, he did the same thing where he's like, tries to lift, looks back at Hom, like, uh-huh. what, are you, what is, how are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Hom, Carol struck in, is phenomenal. Mm-hmm. So good in this episode and really doubled down on the Mr. Hom's a drunk stuff. <laughs> oh, like, yeah. He was a serious drunk in this yeah. episode. I mean, between guzzling that whole, I assume it was Romulan Ale based on its blue color. Oh, yeah. Guzzling that whole bottle, which I could not believe. And then we catch him finishing their drinks when he's cleaning up the table. And then he's later, when we see him again, he's still drinking. Like, he's drinking in every scene outside the transport. <laughs> I think he, his, his humor works. He's like Harpo Marx, yes. you know? He, doesn't, get to, he doesn't, doesn't say a word, obviously, but his stuff connects. And he gets a little tipsy acting. After down in the bottle, which I appreciated. <laughs> I, I didn't caught that, but uh, it I, it, I if you can imagine being the the valet for Luxana, you would, man. I kind of wonder you would why need to drink he, that. He hasn't jumped his bones yet, but I guess hmm. right is the help. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so we haven't got totally away from the romantic talk yet. No. I thought it was very interesting when I can't remember who said it, but they talk about Luxana wanting to to marry somebody. And they said humans no longer own each other that way. And that made me think that was almost a, a statement of humans are not monogamous or aren't beholden to a certain partner. Is the I way think it was I more the beholden line, part. Which the rest of Star Trek contradicts. So it, the line seemed out of place and weird. I get this. What I've been saying, just the whole thing yeah. is very, uh, you know. That that sound effect for uh, for the listening audience. I, I'm I'm putting my fingers together <laughs> and just it's forced. Um, yeah. yeah, there we go. <laughs> I like that Picard catches Riker gossiping about him on the bridge. Oh god, <laughs> that was another one of my things. I thought was just really out of character. First of all, uh, what, what bit, he, had, yeah. he had Riker doing the uh, one of the Riker maneuvers uh, yeah. right by Wesley, and it was just this whole kind of uh. aha, we're telling a funny story. I'm I'm luring Wesley into getting being reprimanded and just this whole weird kind of I don't know. So just, while I agree that Riker wouldn't normally gossip about his captain, first of all, I think he's already excited because Loxana's there, and that puts him on edge a bit. And then it's about sex, which we know is one of Riker's mm, favorite topics. Right. <laughs> so that's where I excuse it as being. Huh. Yeah. I the dinner 
the Bacard not understanding uh, that no one's invited to dinner. That was interesting the way they played it. I guess it makes you think who actually issues the invitations. Is Loxana supposed to call everybody up that she wants to invite when there's a diplomat? Right. Did you guys think the seduction was awkward or sad? Oh, man. I felt like I was locked in on the, the comedic aspect of what they were doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think they, they played it off well enough that it kept it from, if, if you really thought too hard about it, it would have, yeah, but I, I see what you're saying. I started just not laughing, and then I ended up in the sad category. Oh, no. <laughs> it made me bummed out. I thought so. something about it fell a little bit flat. Yeah, it did. Honestly, I expected it to be funnier than it was. Um, I, I like Picard's reactions to Data arriving and, and, and the, the, the facial expressions <laughs> yeah, and egging him on for the... Blocker. <laughs> yeah, for for the uh, the anecdotes and everything, I, just the, his. I thought he was selling that really well. You know, Patrick Stewart. We'll was. get to it next week, but data is used for the same purpose next week by Worf. I, and I you know, I imagine that might be one of my notes. In fact, <laughs> I thought the idea was going to be that data ends up with Loxwana. See, that would have been a good I, idea. I actually, wrote down why didn't Picard offer data? Certainly, data would have been willing. He can match her quadruple or more. <laughs> I mean, he's not going to marry her and leave the ship, but he could certainly satisfy her while he, she's there. He matched he's up with Tasha Yar. Reverse. Do you he's guys remember her? He's in multiple tickets. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> that, that, that goes to the whole old-fashioned thing of she can't just want sex for sex. It has to be this channeled into right. this mating thing. So here's where I thought there might be some genuine interest on Picard's part is he actually stays at the dinner with her. And yes, he brings in the mm-hmm. rooster blocker data. And mm-hmm. I'm saying rooster blocker sent off to be yeah. with right. Um but he he actually stays there. He does seem to enjoy her company, and I don't mm-hmm. think it's just about being rude. And then when he hides in Dixon Hill, I almost feel like he's removing the temptation from himself rather than completely just avoiding. It's fair. I I wrote down, oh no, holodeck. Uh, <laughs> as you guys know, I am not crazy about these things. But um, But yeah, I think that's not a bad point, Jim. There was a very meta comment when he went in Dixon Hill where the um, woman, what's her name, Madeline, played by Rhonda um, Aldrich, says, I haven't seen you in a year, Dix. Or it's, uh, it yeah. feels like I haven't seen uh-huh. you in a year. And I enjoyed that because the big goodbye was about a year ago. And she, it was the same actress. She was in both and she's in a third episode uh, in a couple of years down the road. So I enjoy getting to see her again and, and making those those meta connections. That was good. I'm disappointed his lieutenant, the lieutenant wasn't there from the previous. Hmm. Well, he was shot. He probably isn't going to chance going back. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> While we're talking about the Dixon Hill, Rex, the bartender, Rod Arons, who's mm-hmm. best known for playing Mr. Hansen in the film Rent, and then he's third best known for this. Oh, wow. um, he, he's not doesn't have a ton of credits. He is in an episode of Star Trek Voyager, so we'll see him there. Um, other than that, I think that these are his only Star Trek credits. Uh, I was looking to see if he's listed for another episode of TNG, but I don't see one. I liked him as Rex, and I liked again like Data. I thought he was a good option for her. I understand she was a little bit feelings hurt that mm. he wasn't real, and yet. Right. He could keep up with their stamina. Like, you could program him to be... In a weird way, their relationship was the most real in the entire episode. Right? <laughs> Although okay, I do so, well, know how Loxana doesn't know what a holodeck is or how it works. Well, and I, I'm i still confused that people can just enter into other people's holodeck things. Yeah. But you're still in there. You just open the door and go in. And Colleen asked the question I asked, and I think I answered it right. She's like... How come he's in a uniform and those guys aren't? I said, well. <laughs> oh, when Riker went in? Yeah, it's just they. The characters it's up are to programmed them, right? not to notice. Yeah, yeah, that's what I. That's I was, I, I was, yeah, I was thinking you could program the um, the holodeck to do something of that sort. I did uh, like when they asked about Rex's last name, and he's like, "I don't have a last name, I guess." <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I, I didn't understand that. It felt like Picard didn't understand Dixon Hill. So Picard didn't. <laughs> I think he understood it, but. He didn't even try to stay in character. He's talking to him about World War II that hadn't happened yet and the right. outcome. And it, it, yeah, last time he was so into it, and this time he wasn't at like even trying to play the game. Right. Again, I, I feel like, I feel like a jerk about it at this point. I I, I would still start to blame the writing of the, it was just oh, yeah, every, everything was everything was very much to kind of, kind of thrown in for comedic effect, and I, I I was entertained. But if you started 
it, it's so easy to pull on these little threads and just. And there was no I, I think reason he... for Data to dress up at all. Although I did like them introduced as Nails and Carlos. And the, yeah, and I guess my overall thing was like, wouldn't Picard know the drink that Dixon Hill drinks? Yes. Yeah, I mean, that'd be, that'd be, that'd be like going back and being James Bond and not and being surprised. Like, I don't know what I don't know what what do I usually drink? <laughs> Uh, I'll have it stirred, not shaken. Uh, but. Just uh, whatever you surprise me. Just, you know, just. <laughs> I thought all the Picard having to freeze quick things were weird too in the holodeck. Mm. Like computer freeze. It's like the bullets can't hurt you. The safeties are on. Nah, well, well, I, 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 I wouldn't trust. <laughs> I immediately thought. I immediately was like, "Oh God, the holodeck's malfunctioning again." What a surprise! So I'm also I'm almost glad that that was. I'm very actually am glad it wasn't the case, but. That's what I thought it was going to be like, oh, it's malfunctioning. But I do want to talk about a couple of the other guest actors that were in the holodeck. Mm-hmm. Robert Costanzo, Costanzo, not Oh, Costanzo, I was like, what? <laughs> played played a Slade Bender, who was one of the assassins, I guess. He's best known for being in Total Recall, Die Hard 2, City Slickers, Batman, Mask of the Phantasms. Hmm. So he's he's of, got quite a few credits. One of the guys was Joey Tribbiani's dad. Was that? Oh, um, huh. Yes, that was that was, that was Robert. Him. That makes sense. He's about. been in a lot. Yeah, he's yeah. a great oh, that, oh, that guy. This is his only episode of Star Trek that he's in. Period. Yeah, that but, makes sense. But the other gangster with the crazy eyes <laughs> that, that came after them. I don't know if you got that, uh, uh-huh. but that was Robert O'Reilly, and this was his first episode of Star Trek. But he's going to do four more episodes of TNG uh, and eight of Deep Space Nine as Gowron, the Chancellor of the Klingons. Huh. We'll have 12 episodes of him as, as the leader of the Klingon people. Wow. And it was kind of fun to see him out of makeup. We'll get to see him out of makeup one more time in an episode of Deep Space Nine. Um, it's a, I'm not going to get into it deep, but there's a reason Thank why you. people are out uh, <laughs> of makeup there. But it's no, that's, not Gowron um... necessarily. But it, yeah, Gowron is a, a major character for a long time to come in Klingon politics. When Loxana hits on Worf, that actually made sense to... Uh, okay, before Alexei hits the wharf, I'm sorry. Wesley is hitting on wharf, isn't he? What? I mean... Oh, uh, when he tells him he's very handsome? Yes. Oh, it's... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I no. I was hitting on wharf. I, I could see Wesley going both ways. Yeah. That was very much the, the 80s uh, cultural humor thing of like, well, oh, but you're okay for one of those. Yeah. Just the, <laughs> uh, I was like, oh, come on. <laughs> I mean, but, it was a bad line, but it yeah, certainly felt the line like was it was bad. more than a compliment. And then Lexi... You know what? I'll say it. Worf is a good-looking guy. He is. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And he's only going to get better looking as as they fix the makeup and make it even... Even with those that bad is teeth. Inter- that is interesting how that, that, that uh, sort of evolved without me even realizing. But you can kind of... You can certainly see the, you know, episode one versus where he ends up mm-hmm. being. Yeah, I, oh, I, yeah. I, mm-hmm. I agree. The makeup just gets better and better every yep. year. Lexana Lexana hits on Wesley, and that's a bit creepy. <laughs> Even though she says she's only gonna hit on him a little bit, but he's not old enough. But it gets creepy there. So, <laughs> how old is Wesley at this point? Like seventeen. Sixteen. Seventeen. Okay. I think so. Well, one of my alternate episodes is Wesley's private lessons because if this was four or five years older in the eighties. That's what happens is when he loses his virginity <laughs> to an older woman and, you know, all his friends and there's shenanigans and everything else. So wasn't it, wasn't it so much, yeah, it wasn't everything so much more fun before things like that actually really started happening in real life <laughs> and in the news. And you're like, Oh, okay. That's yeah. Uh, that, yeah. Back then it was, it was a <laughs> hilarious movie. As long as it was a teenage boy mm-hmm. with an older woman. Yeah. My alternate episode was Bar- we haven't met Barclay yet. He's an engineer on next year. Yes, but I feel like Barclay and Loxana could have had some fun. Why he then? Would not have had the the spine to stand up to her. He would have totally been chum to her shark. Oh. Uh, my other alternate episode was Loxana Loxana about her erotic journey from Pacifica. <laughs> <laughs> that is it. It's also my side <laughs> part of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Because that, I'd much rather see her just getting it on, and not necessarily entirely getting it on, but why not? Is she, yeah, charming people on planets all over the galaxy, star base to star base, you know, a guy in every port. Why can't she do it? Kirk did it. Well, after she hits on Wesley, she then hits on Worf. 
And then she asks Mr. Hom who's next. And Mr. Hom like puts his yes. hand over his eyes, which I assume meant they're going for Jordy next. Right. But that's that, what I thought this episode. That's that was that thought. was my note. I was I said his pantomime reminds me that we haven't seen Jordy at all for some reason. He's credit only this week. Funny. But that's all, that almost was, that almost makes it even funnier because we don't seem to just assume you're gonna know what he means and sorry. he was also in the holodeck at that point. <laughs> no kidding. I thought no matter how strong her sexual energy was, going after Riker was completely uncalled for. I agree. And it, it just, it didn't, yeah. Of all, of all the many things that didn't jive, that one especially. I, I really felt like on that, she was both uh, poking at Deanna and right. Picard with no intention of going through with it. And yet yeah. it never was made clear in the episode that she had no intention of going through with it. And it, I think that was it, a big weakness. I felt like they, they kind of hinted at sort of subtly when, it, when she actually got to the, the holodeck, it was sort of like a means to getting to the card. I can't remember the exact line, but it was something along the lines of like, I didn't really expect him to do it anyway. Or, or no, yo, he he's, he's uh, confirming that he couldn't handle me or something like that. So the holodeck scene where she goes to Rex's bar does do go a long way towards confirming that a lot of what she's saying is just messing with them and not 100% sincere in her motivations. How so? Where she's basically like, like you said, she was kind of like, oh, well, yeah, I didn't think he could handle me anyway. And then nobody's <laughs> looking at her, so she goes to Rex. And I feel like while she is intent on finding a mate, I think she's purposely announcing an engagement without telling them or telling Picard to quit thinking dirty thoughts about her just to mess with them. And I feel like that bar scene, just the way she talked to them, really confirmed that for me, that Hmm. half of it is just her having fun, which is totally in keeping with her character and personality. One of the ways they added the tension in there or the reason for Picard to have to hide in the holodeck was the idea that Luxana was just going to like lose control and just melt down if she thought that she was officially being rejected. I mean, it seems seems like she was saving face by those comments, right? So Yeah, it could have been her saving face. I don't know. Nobody did explicitly reject her. They just made it to the conference, and they're like, okay, now we got to send you to the conference. Bye. Bull (laughs) dodged. Do you think that, that, I mean, there could have been a payoff for that, or do you think they indicated that that wasn't, or or that was an exaggeration or what, though? I mean, it's just. Yeah, I don't know. Like I said, I think somebody like Barclay would have made for a better ending because there was a possibility there that they could be an ongoing partner, whereas none of these people are going to be ongoing partners for her. Uh, in fact, well, they're, they're, they're the only guys in the ro- ship, though. Her best romantic story isn't until Deep Space Nine because she does guest star in Deep Space Nine as well. Oh, nice. So, yeah, it's I think just once, once or twice, maybe twice. She might do two Deep Space Nines. Q only did one. I think Loxanne does two or three. But she actually has a legitimate attraction to one of the DS9 characters that I feel is return and interesting. So She could have Charlie Exit just randomly walked into fallen men into their quarters. Yeah. She <laughs> absolutely could have. I mean, if this was the TOS, she could sexually assault whoever she wanted. That's right. <laughs> speaking of Especially which Especially if it was Janice Rand. Yes. Uh, speaking of which, Deanna just walked right into the dinner. Yeah. I mean she she knew that there was the possibility mm-hmm. that something was happening and there's no knock, no ring, just like right in. And luckily, you know. Well, first We're not of all, knocking I think, anymore? I think the possibility that something could be happening is why she wanted to get in there quick. Right. Yeah. To stop it. But I, th- I, w- I would think that she would be afraid. Well, I don't know. Would she be afraid to see anything? I think she was uh, hoping and believing that Picard could resist. And he did. Hmm. And she was pleased. I enjoyed how Luxana asked how to get to the holodeck and the lights let her. Like, just follow the lights. Oh. I liked that. We haven't yeah. seen that in a while. I swear we saw that in a season one episode, that the hallway could just show you where to go. My last note was, what did we think about the twist that the fish were actually assassins the whole time? That was <laughs> lazy and deus ex machina and just like, let's wrap it up. Was it and, deus ex machina? Because mm. we didn't know there was a threat. You're right. You're, 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 well, and I was thinking up until then, like, oh, this is kind of a cool episode where it's just like, hey, this, they're on a journey. Yeah, it's like, it was, it was, it was superfluous. We didn't need it. Well, I mean, perhaps the threat like was just a joke. Uh, well, yeah, the, the threat in that case was uh, Luxana's sex drive. Yeah, so, right. <laughs> it was, it was a way of, well, I, I like I like the idea that they were confirming that she really was telepathic and, and accurate to the point where she could find something like that that they didn't because it was getting a little too dementia esque or something. Well, right, because yeah, because I wrote she seems really ditzy, and I thought the same thing. Like she really is starting to lose it. It's not just the the phase. 
until she's like, oh, yeah, these guys, they have it. Da, 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 da. And it just it seemed really easy. But again, it maybe if the entire episode had been funnier and stayed on that thing, it would have. It would have landed more as a joke, like, oh, by the way, they're assassins, da 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 da. Anyway, what are you doing later? Now that, <laughs> now that we've wrapped this up and we got we got some free time on our hands, why don't yeah. you say we over the planet a few more times and uh, see what we can do here? It did make that's sense a, to me that's great. Stay with her character to not expose them until she needed to, or, you know. Hmm. Did they say that she couldn't tell because they were in a coma? Was that the excuse or not? It's, it, makes, it would make sense. That was my yeah. first thought, you know, but. Yeah. Uh, my last note was that the Antedians are stress eaters. Yeah. <laughs> they were just freaking out until they're like, ah, where do we have? <laughs> or they're starving because they haven't eaten in weeks. It could be that too. Are they, I feel like, and I this is now created my alternate episode three. I feel like they could have potentially inspired the, the creature in the shape of water. That's <laughs> exactly what it was. Somebody and, watched this episode and said, sex, fish, why didn't they connect them? Yes, and in, that, and in which case... They should have got Luxana with the fish people. Everybody's problems are solved. She- I, need, I need to just like take a look at the, the patent database to see if anybody's come up with the sex and fish yet. That's <laughs> a, just a, a great name for something. That's a hit movie. She talks in mid-beam, which I think we've talked about before. Always makes me uncomfortable. Mm. That last beam took a little bit longer than yeah, you. Yeah, I, I didn't like it. it. It gives me the, I just don't like it. I don't like it from a logistical sense and just... I would never want to talk while I was in mid beam. You know it's like, trying, it's like trying to grab the drink while it was materializing the, the, uh, <laughs> right. the replicator. Yes. The way they save that is we see where she ends up beaming, and you hear that line out of context of the people waiting. For her. <laughs> 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 they go to Pacifica this episode, right? Sure. Which is the same episode they were going to in conspiracy until Picard goes to meet up with the. Seriously. Yeah. Oh, it's great Apparently, continuity. I like that. I'm like, I know they've they've gone here before because we talked about FCC versus Pacifica. Maybe they maybe they never made it. Favorite yet. Supreme Court cases. Yeah, and I think I don't. I think they get there this time because that's where the conference is. So yeah. Yeah. So they finally get there. My other note, and I don't remember specifically what happened, was what she said, but I think it's Pulaski and Troy talking, and or maybe it's Pulaski and Picard, but. Pulaski has a couple jabs at Picard, which I enjoy, but I don't remember what. Uh, something about his reflexes needing to train him or something. Oh, that's yeah. Right. Yeah, yes. <laughs> I, keep, I like keep that. him on his toes. A lot of the the the, the last the, the the bits didn't land for me, but I like that one. That's my last note. Stephen, you were right about Pacifica, but unfortunately, according to Memory Alpha, these are the only two times it was mentioned. Ah, uh, okay. Hmm. Just Except you're seeing this in the Star Trek Titan novels, where Riker's a captain. They do mention it, but we still and we mention their native people, but it's still not explored fully. Did we talk about it's a water planet or something, which seemed it a little is, on the nose? It's an yeah. ocean planet renowned for its warm blue waters and white beaches. And its sister planet, Indiana, uh, named after the Indiana Ocean. Indian Ocean. <laughs> well, you gotta you gotta wonder like how much water there has to be to be classified as a water planet if they have beaches at all. That's uh, yeah. <laughs> but that's what's a good point. What's odd here is there was a native race there, the Selkies. So why are you naming it after an Earth ocean? Shouldn't don't they have a name for it? Keith, it's all water and all beaches. It's one or the other. There's, no, I mean, there's nothing else. <laughs> oh, I, sh- I should mention this episode was directed by our good friend Rob Bowman, who directed a whole bunch of episodes. He's almost done. He's only got two more episodes left. But he directed Q-Who, The Dauphine, A Matter of Honor, Elementary Dear Data, The Child, Heart of Glory, Too Short a Season, Data Lore, The Battle, where no one has gone before. So he's a frequent director in these early days of TNG. Let's uh, get to our rankings here. Scale of 1 to 10, how annoying was Wesley? This is going to easily be my highest. uh, 7. Wow. I... I, I was so enraged by him messing with somebody else's lunch <laughs> or dinner, whatever it was. I'm gonna I'm gonna put him at a four, which is high for me. Yeah, but I yeah. Won't, I'm not going to a seven. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I had him at a six, and then he got into his other conversations. I'm like, I'm giving him one more. So yeah. <laughs> oh man, I I start uh, getting too meta about the whole thing as far as um, the the idea of the character versus the writing for the episode and all these mm-hmm. other things. But uh, it's got to get out of the weeds there and just say it really is at least a five. I think whether, whether it's his fault, quote unquote yeah. or not. I mean, it's, it's yeah. not, it's not uh, Will Wheaton, Will Wheaton's right. fault, but. <laughs> so that means his average score is a 5.3, which 
only one episode even comes close in season one where no one has gone before. It was a 5.25. Oh, I'm, I'm going to have to go with six, I think. I just... Oh, was, yeah, five, five, yeah, five was the baseline. I think that... <laughs> okay, he's a 5.6. Either way, it's his highest ranking. I think that Steven has the right idea in the sense that this feels like it's going to be higher than anything I'm going to get to. Well, yeah, for him. that doesn't mean and, uh, we have to rank him high. But I mean, it's, it's not... It's, <laughs> No, it's like grading on a curve or something. I, I can't think of the, the way to, to explain this. It's just there has to be like a, a baseline of some sort. There has to be like a a, a least and a, and a greatest. And I don't know. Yeah. This I think there's probably some room for him to get to yeah, a we're 10, not theoretically. Like but Ensign Joel Savage, who I think would give him a 10 every episode. <laughs> Yeah, I think Joel Joel was there that episode ranked yeah. 5.25. I think, so yeah, I bet he was. Oh, yes, was. yes, yes. He yes. blew the curve. I bet he was. <laughs> And that's how we got a 0.25 instead of a 0.3 or a <laughs> was Joel Savage. Or I guess it would be 5.7 because it's 0.66 anyway. Yeah. Uh, who was your annoying character of the episode? Wesley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't think of anyone more annoying, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, it, it would have to be Luxana if anybody else, but I, I think that the Wesley yeah. is more annoying than her in this. And uh, if, if we can pick him, I, I didn't realize we could. Uh, yeah, we can pick main characters yeah. for annoying. Yeah. Well, I mean, Wesley himself, I thought the idea was that it was somebody who was not him for that. but Oh, no. We can, uh, we've picked Wesley before. Oh, uh, okay. But yeah, yeah. So, crush of Star Trek. What do we got, Steven? You're on Brenna from last Oh, time. man. This is throwing me off for everything else. But I'm definitely keeping her. <laughs> I had already typed in Loxana repeating my season one pick until oh, I yeah. with Brenna, and then I was like, yeah. oh, I'm, I'm going to stay with Brenna as well. Yeah, I forgot. Yep, definitely. Keith? Nope. Stick it with Salar? Yeah, I think it's going to... Oh, it's funny their name is Salar. Well, <laughs> I, I, I'm, 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 I guess I'm getting prescient all of a sudden, but we'll, we'll just leave it, leave it at that for the moment. <laughs> no drunk Mr. Holm for you? No. Okay. <laughs> Let's rank the episode. Her first appearance was in Haven, and in season uh, one, Haven ranked number one for the season. Oh, wow. So she led season one, her episode. Season two, I think we need to start towards the middle. Yes. So let's go with Up the Long Ladder, which we just watched. I go lower. I suppose so. I feel like we're in the same kind of comedic range mm-hmm. of things yeah. they were doing. Yep. Uh, right. that's, that's tough for me. What's, what's below that? Right below that is another episode from the same writer, The Royale. Oh, Mm. I feel like this is better than that. Um, really? Just. <laughs> I think it had better moments, but I think overall the Royale was a bit better. I was going to go lower. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Right below right. that is the Samaritan Snare. I, I think, think I, I think I like this one better. Yeah. I think we're hitting it. Yeah. So we're ranking this number 10 of 20 at the moment. So Loxana really fell with her season two appearance. Yeah. Luckily, she will have other appearances to help make up for it. Next week. We will be talking The Emissary, and according to IMDb, the Enterprise addresses the emergency of an old Klingon ship coming out of stasis and ready to fight the Federation. Stasis. A a half-human, half-Klingon emissary arrives to help, who once knew Worf intimately. I believe that's untrue, based on the episode, but that's okay. Uh, We'll talk about that soon. Until then, live long. And prosper. Stay out of Luxanda's way. (laughs) Man eater. (laughs) it's all been done presents who's got the time